with Pete Derrigan and Lindsay Louts, who are going to be speaking to you in just a moment. Um, one of the things I just wanted to make note of with both Pete and Lindsay, and one of the reasons why when Len and I were talking about resources that might um, do this workshop today, both Pete and uh, Lindsay have very rich, very deep business experience in addition to being very experienced search consultants. They've walked in your shoes. They both, both have built businesses. They know what it's like to be a startup or a growth oriented company. They know the challenges that are faced. They know what it's like to try to build a team and the challenges that are inherent with that, especially in a startup environment or a very early stage company. So I think that they bring you know, a somewhat unique perspective in being not only business professionals, but very experienced search consultants as well. And as I said, having walked in the shoes and understand the challenges firsthand that you face in building out a team as your same time you're building a company. So with that, um, Pete is the managing director for California and Lindsay is a director with the firm. Uh, both are very experienced search consultants. And with that, Pete, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, I, I think that uh, just in terms of a very, very brief uh, introduction to just me and my background, uh, I started in uh, banking and capital markets in the Bay Area, grew up in L.A., and uh, I've, uh, the rubber band brought me back to Southern California, but um, I've worked in both Northern and Southern California for 20-odd years, uh, mostly as a search consultant. And uh, as Mark mentioned, you know, we've built businesses. I had my own search firm that I built from scratch and then I joined Stanton's Case, which has similar challenges because we are locally owned uh, and we are global, but that local ownership really uh, allows us uh, to freely operate within, you know, from Fortune 500 companies all the way down to, uh, you know, pre-revenue, venture back, uh, angel back uh, organizations. Uh, who need our expertise and sometimes are a little bit challenged to pay for it. But we have uh, the kind of uh, magnetism to startups like anybody else has. We're fascinated by technology that uh, uh, is being deployed that could be a game changer, you know, a better mousetrap, opportunity to make tons of money and, uh, and actually change a lot of things uh, in the business world just based on some very significant breakthroughs. So, I've been with Stanton Chase for 12 years and uh, on and off have been involved in working with uh, startups. And uh, Lindsay has got extensive uh, experience in Northern California with startup companies and I'll let him take it away and uh, tell you a little bit about himself. Yeah, thanks Pete, welcome everybody. Uh, I was born and raised in Southern California, graduated from USC and uh, always uh, wanted to become the president of a company. And I had that chance in the early 80s. I founded a company called Positive Video Corporation in San Francisco. And I started with a single sheet of paper with an idea on it and uh, a dream to do something that really hadn't been done before. So uh, I wrote the business plan with my brother. I went out and raised money, took a year, uh, was told no thousands of times, but finally put together a group of individuals to help me fund, seed fund the company. And over the ensuing 10 years, built the company into a powerhouse. I made some great hiring decisions, some terrible ones, uh, but eventually end up selling the, uh, uh, the company, the biggest production company in Canada. And uh, since then, I've started uh, several more companies and everything from action sports to executive search to production. So uh, you can't, uh, for those entrepreneurs, which I think is as much a disease as anything else, you really can't read it in a book. Uh, you've got to get out there. And I have plenty of holes in my back and hopefully I can share some some do's and don'ts with you today that, that may help you. I wish I'd uh, been exposed to a retained firm back then and, and known of how they could uh, help me grow my team and build my team and, and grow my business. I've been in retained executive search. After I sold that company, I got into retained executive search 
and I've been a uh, headhunter, if you will, for the past uh, 30 years. And uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, venture back pre IPO startups, a lot of work with uh, uh, two individuals that had a great idea and a dream that wanted to build something. So I've been in your shoes. And if uh, hopefully we, something Peter, I, or Mark says today, can give you a little uh, uh, point of reference to help you uh, uh, continue on, so be it. So it's great to be here and uh, be a part of this uh, a part of this webinar. So Len, we can probably go to slide two. Do you want to start on this lens? Yeah, I, 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 we, Stanton Chase that uh, Pete and I are uh, involved with is the eighth largest retained executive search firm in the world. And we've got 76 offices in 45 countries and we're retained exclusively by clients to go out and, and uh, find uh, executive team members, board members, uh, VPs and CEOs. Uh, as startup companies, uh, you, sh you shouldn't find a way to afford us because cash flow is king. So we've tried to put together a slide here that will let you know how you can use uh, a retained firm at an early stage, whether you're one or two individuals or you kind of got your team in place and, and you're out looking for funding or whatever. But I think that this is a step that won't cost you a lot of money and can give you more than uh, uh, you can possibly find on your own. But it is possible to add, to add someone like Peter or myself to your advisory board. And, and I am very, very big on advisory boards and what they can add to a startup uh, company. Uh, the, the individual, let's just say I'm on your advisory board. I can help you build out uh, the advisory board by bringing in ind individuals that can really serve as your trusted advisors. Uh, one may be someone that comes out of the uh, venture capital community. Another one may come out with sales and marketing skills or knowledge of your industry. Another one can be engineering focused and have uh, run a company as CTO or whatever. Uh, but these individuals are paid in equity, whatever it might be, warrants, anything that you have. But uh, they are there to help you, to listen to you, to guide you. I like to think that they are your uh, launch Sherpas. And uh, if you find the right person who's been through it, not someone who says, well, I'm an entrepreneur and never done anything. I think that they will uh, pay for their self time and time again. Uh, the advisory board, and especially your, um, your retained search pro that you have on the board can help you uh, really deal with the talent piece of, uh, of your business plan, because you're gonna have to have a business plan in order to raise any money. And uh, I think that in preparing pro forma financials uh, that are never totally accurate, uh, the, uh, the search advisory member can help you uh, develop a, a plan of attack, if you will, in terms of what do you have today? Uh, no, let's not uh, add any, any sales people today because we haven't even proven the product or the idea. Uh, when you are adding people to your, uh, your management team, to your team, the search person uh, can help really conduct uh, reference checks. And this was something I couldn't do as founder of, of uh, my own companies. If, if I called, I, I was given name, rank, and serial number, but a search firm for some crazy reason gets information that goes far beyond uh, name, rank, and serial number. Uh, your search advisory board member can help you, uh, can help serve as your VP of HR in the early stages before you reached a level of employees that, where you need to bring on a vice president of human resources or whatever. Uh, they can make introductions and I've done this with every, I sit, currently sit on four advisory boards 
And in every case, I've been able to make introductions either to funding sources in my network or strategic partners for potential joint ventures, generation of revenue or whatever. And um, uh, eventually, as your company grows and you get big uh, and have the cash resources uh, to afford a retained search firm, then uh, you're ready to go. You can uh, use us to, um, to go out and find and help you build your team beyond a startup phase. So again, it's, it's a low cost way to get a pro involved that can help you, work with you, guide you in the selection of talent, building your team. And I, I, you sleep well at night when you hire the right person, but I'm here to tell you, uh, when you hire the wrong person, it's that person that will keep you awake every single night. So culture we'll talk about as, as uh, we get later into our presentation. But if the, I can interject real briefly. Yeah, uh, that's, just to, that's, go for it, Pete. To, just to clarify what the value proposition of an executive search consultant is, most executive search consultants have an area of specialty that's rather deep. Uh, you know, my background is financial services, as well as supply chain logistics and transportation. But uh, when an executive search firm looks at the entire economy, we break it down into you know, its, its component parts. It could be uh, life sciences and healthcare. It could be financial services. It could be government, education, and nonprofit, uh, supply chain, consumer products, technology of all sorts, whether you know, it be hardware or software, and then professional services. Um, you may want to you know, discern uh, when you are bringing in a, a search consultant to be on an advisory board that they have expertise in your uh, you know, area of focus for the business. But what we do offer is a network uh, and you know, we can have immediate access to talent that may be urgently needed for either the survival or just the launch of your business. And that domain knowledge um, you know, is, is gained over many, many years of talking to people and interviewing candidates. We interview you know, hundreds of candidates a year and those relationships can be made uh, you know, to bring in not only talent, but introductions to people uh, that will get you what you need. It might be a banker, it might be legal help, it might be um, you know, any other level of advice, but you know, the value proposition of an executive search consultant, especially if they're old guys like Lindsay and I with lots and lots of experience, uh, can be a, you know, a dramatic addition to your, your business plan. So Len, I think you can go to slide three. This is a little bit more about culture, right, Lindsay? Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I. Hopefully, you it's come through in my discussion here that talent is the most critical thing uh, you'll need to become successful, and great teams uh, achieve great success, and teams that are dysfunctional or uh, don't, aren't really in sync, uh, they keep you awake at night and they don't work. And it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's challenging to build a team of people uh, that can fit into your culture. And the talent that is really can fit into your culture is so much different than an individual that would prefer to be a part of, of a corporate America. And I can, I used to hear with some regularity how a 25 year uh, veteran of HP and engineering was a true entrepreneur and ready to, uh, uh, you know, ready to make the move. But uh, I've seen cases where when you try and dig, bring a large corporate culture uh, processes of doing things into a startup, it, it absolutely is a disaster. But some of the things you can do as a leader of your company is to hire people that can really believe in your dream, who are as excited about your dream, who believe in, in what it can become, uh, has a passion for the space that you happen to be in, uh, is really a true entrepreneur. 
Uh, and if you can't get someone that, uh, if you come across somebody who's just looking for a job and and uh, kind of see maybe some, some upside, uh, potential for upside, if they don't share your vision of, and passion, uh, boy, it's an uphill battle. Uh, I think it's important, really important as a startup to hire people that are really uh, the best athletes, if you will, people who are multifunctional. Uh, you can't staff the company as, as you would a, a post C round uh, a company where you have a VP for every functional area in the company. Uh, you've got to preserve cash. Well, one, you got to get it. Um, but each person's got to be able to be handle more than just one specific area. The sale, if you have a sales guy early on, got to be able to handle marketing. The engineer's got to do everything from uh, QA to, uh, you know, driving a product roadmap. The CFO's got to handle finance, raising money, HR, uh, and all accounting functions. So you have to get more out of each person so you don't have to spend uh, for multiple people to drain your cash. Uh, the, these people should be in risk takers, to say the least. They should be able, they should be willing to take a lot less cash and, um, uh, and more equity, if you will. And when I started my, own, my first company, uh, I was uh, by far the least compensated person in the organization. Of course, I had the most equity, but but even so, uh, you really look for people that thrive in a startup environment where things can change every single day. It's hard to have a single uh, mission statement when, when things around you are changing, if you will. But uh, you need people that can buy into, hey, we got to pr preserve our cash. I really want the equity upside. I think it really, this cultural fit is absolutely critical. You gotta hire people that really are willing to go the distance, uh, that aren't looking for a corner office and an admin. People that will make coffee, show up at seven in the morning and leave after midnight. Um, and there's other uh, great things you can do, but it's really cultural fit, multi-talented star athletes who believe in your dream. Some of the risky things that you can do uh, that can get you results that aren't necessarily what you're looking for. Uh, uh, you know, it's great to have friends. Uh, however, I, I don't recommend it. Uh, I was in business with my brother. When times were great, it was great. Uh, when times weren't great, it was really, really bad. So I really avoid bringing family members into the organization. But I recognize it happens with some regularity. Uh, if you don't check people out, uh, you get surprised, if you will. And I learned from experience, my head of engineering had a major cocaine problem uh, that kept him from always making it to work. And uh, he kept me awake every single night. Morale, he drove morale into the ground. I lost my star editor uh, because I really couldn't check references thoroughly. and. Uh, so um, I think you need to, again, hire, if you hire someone who can only do one thing, you'll never make it because you'll have to hire someone to cover each specific function in order to launch the business. And if you try and hire, this is kind of a, something I agree but disagree with because in my first company, I came out of the wine industry into the world of video, film, and entertainment, audio, animation, graphics. Uh, I knew nothing about the area, but I happened to have the skill of putting great teams of people together and uh, putting, in, putting in place a, a structure that would allow them to do their best. So uh, I had no track record per se, but as Pete mentioned in his comments, when you uh, select an, an individual retained search guy to put on your advisor board, make sure you get somebody who really knows your industry and what it entails and and because uh, uh, someone completely out of the industry won't talk the language and probably can't really help you. 
Uh, Pete, yeah, Mark, yeah, Len, 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 encouraged, Len encouraged us uh, early on uh, to provide some case studies and one of the uh, big fails on one of the companies that we uh, worked with in the cannabis industry was uh, better than probably five to seven years ago. And they had uh, not only uh, technology, but also some expertise in real estate and zoning, which would allow uh, cannabis distribution uh, companies that, were, that they would work with uh, to locate in cities that were friendly to cannabis and to get the zoning requirements passed and everything. But the problem was that they had a lot of very highly skilled people, uh, but they weren't all aligned. So they had some dispensing technology that they were gonna leverage. They also wanted to leverage the real estate expertise on the, on the leadership team. <clears throat> and oftentimes those people were off doing uh, activities that were um, you know, not in sync with the overall business plan. So you can bring all the talent together uh, that might be impressive, but if it's not aligned to the uh, direction of the business and to the business plan, uh, it's going to be a failure. But, uh, you know, we can bring some of these examples in of what to do, what not to do uh, throughout the presentation. And I'll note that we're, what, about half past right now, so we probably have another 15 minutes to go. And uh, we'll move to the next slide. Yeah, Pete, if I could make just a couple of quick points before you move on. Please. Yeah. Um, you know, with regards to some of the great things to do, uh, between LAVA and SoCal Bio and some other organizations, I probably sit in on about 100 company pitches a year. And one of the consistent themes that comes through is if team isn't the number one factor, it's certainly number two. And as, so as a result, you know, investors are going to be looking at the, that, the team that you've put together, and they're also going to be looking to see what voids, what gaps exist in that team. And to go back to the first slide where Lindsay was talking about trusted advisors, having that advisory board is a great way to fill in any voids or gaps that you might have in that early executive, that early leadership team. You can bring in subject matter expertise. You can bring in disciplines on your advisory board people that'll help credentialize not only your team, but your idea by being involved. And it's a great way to fill any, any voids or gaps that you have in the, in the existing management or leadership team. And I've had several investors make the comment that after seeing a company's pitch, that they're not sure about the idea, they're not sure about the business, the innovation, the technology, but they were extremely strong believers in either the person or the team that they had assembled. And they were going to make an investment based on the feeling about that team and that they wanted to be linked to that team. They didn't know whether that was going to be the business that succeeded, but they were convinced that team was going to succeed and they wanted to be along for the ride. So that's how powerful team can be. Um, and the, and the, as well as the advisory board and how that can help round out the experience that you might be lacking directly in those initial managers and, and, and people in leadership positions. So. Back to you guys. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, Mark, your point's well taken. Uh, I mean, think of it, if you're a startup and, and if Steve Jobs were on your board of directors, I'm telling you, you'd get the attention of most any investor I can think of. So it allows you, for marketing purposes, to look more established, bigger, if you will, than you really are. That would be quite a feat since he's passed away. Yeah, no, I really, I know that. Uh, well, then Jack Welsh. Oh, wait, he passed away too. Well, <laughs> no, but the, the point is uh, ha by having a distinguished uh, um, advisory board, you can get the attention of uh, other people that might want to become involved with the company. Investors will take a look. A, a, a deeper look at uh, you will because they say gee if Steve Jobs believes in what what uh, Bill and Bob are doing it's got to be I got to take a look at this. Lindsay, so, Lindsay quick yeah. question could you um, just talk about what is the um, nuances of an advisory board as far as informal advisors versus what is a form what constitutes a formal advisory board and what steps do people need to do to constitute that if that's necessary. You know, we may be getting into the legal side of it where I, I don't have the expertise, but on the advisory boards that 
I've been a part of and where I've built. They were really, uh, uh, um, I wasn't a board member at all because I don't want that responsibility, nor was I being paid as a board member. But there was a, uh, there were advisory boards, if you will, and I helped build them, uh, compensated in equity or other non-cash uh, items. Uh, but they were not registered with any entity. Again, it's, the, it's an inexpensive way to, uh, to get a lot of things. Attention, advice, referrals, uh, there's just no end. And I've, I've seen uh, startups that didn't have an advisory board in place. And my first recommendation is you got to get surrounded by people that can do all the things an advisory board can do. Uh, if I can use a, a, jump to case study, I was involved with a company called Container Track, and they <clears throat> they have technology that uh, GPS and INS and gyro technology allowed to track containers um, at port side and identify them at port side within 12 inches. Uh, so at the time, uh, uh, port security was really important and tracking because of bomb threats and all that really important. So I got on the advisory board. Uh, the company was going to be dealing with a lot of uh, leasing of equipment. So I brought on another advisor who I found, a close friend of mine who, who had been at GATX leasing. He provided the expertise in leasing. Um, I did I did searches, if you will, identified candidates for them to fill their VP engineering and CFO roles. I made some introductions to some potential clients, uh, and the company grew and uh, built up and eventually sold to another uh, company in Chicago. Um, so again, we talked about earlier about having individuals on this call it a friends of the family advisory board, whatever you want. Uh, people who can add value to what you're doing. Now, as the company gets bigger and does all those good kind of things and, and needs a board, you know, then Pete mentioned earlier, we do board searches. But in the early days, you don't have the money. You, you got to conserve the cash. The, the people that put up the money don't want to see you bringing on board uh, for board members and paying them, you know, a lot of money because you need every dollar you can get. So, um, yeah, I Lindsay, I um, if I could, for you know, one of the ways that I like to think of the trusted advisors or the advisory board is kind of like a kitchen cabinet. Yeah, you know, there they you don't, go. They don't, they don't have a formal role in the administration, but they're very trusted and valued confidants and advisors they yeah. bring some experience, some subject matter expertise, maybe industry knowledge that's very yeah. valuable in those early stages. And like you were alluding to earlier, they also add credibility to what you're doing and to your team by just the fact that they're attached to the organization in some way. It's not a formal board role. They're, they don't have an official corporate position, but just the fact that they're engaged, they bring some expertise some experience that's going to be of value to you just helps with credentializing you with investors as well as helping you through some of those early challenges where you're still trying to figure things out. So I always kind of think of it as like a kitchen cabinet. Yeah. Ex excellent term, Mark. The, uh, uh, and, and I like that, that very much. Uh, I think the line of demarcation for, uh, you know, when a board goes from being a kitchen cabinet, to a formal board is that they're uh, written into the LLC in some manner and they have uh, probably an, a formal agreement with the LLC to take, uh, you know, a small uh, percentage of uh, equity in the organization. So, yeah. yeah. I think that uh, the, the attraction for a gray hair like me, speaking for myself, is uh, one, I won't get on, on an advisory board unless I share this passion for where the company's going and so on and so forth that we alluded to on a prior slide. But uh, for me, it, 
it allows me to vicariously play a role in the success of building a company where I don't have to report to anybody. I don't have to go to meetings. I, I, I don't have to put up with any of the junk. I can just help the company and with an equity upside, maybe, you know, you make some money down the road. But I have, uh, I have the uh, sense that I played a major role in helping Container Track grow and then be sold uh, without having to, you know, get back in and work for someone else, if you will. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what, what you got to talk to someone like me about, gee, Lindsay, we need you. We need you to advise the company. We value your expertise. We need a Sherpa like you. We need you to help build the board, make sure we don't get into trouble. And for that, we're going to reward you with equity so that when we become the next LinkedIn, as they all say they will, uh, you will benefit, uh, you know, financially. Uh, so uh, if, if we want to move into this next slide and just kind of give uh, everybody an overview of what an executive search looks like, uh, you know, Lindsay obviously mentioned that uh, the cash flow limitations uh, normally in an early stage company is not going to allow or an executive search, but oftentimes there's uh, an extremely strong team of maybe technologists who don't have uh, the professional management experience. And sometimes the investors will uh, insist on the hiring of an executive search to get a COO or a CFO placed where, you know, they anticipate going public and they might, might want a CFO that's done it several times with early stage companies. Or uh, if there's a uh, you know, an expansive operation that has to be run. Somebody who's a professional operating executive that'll fit in. But, you know, when we look at a search, it's normally looked at as a 90 day project. And uh, as the slide shows, the first part of the uh, definition of a search is to put together um, a uh, position profile and obviously uh, a contract that'll be palatable to both parties in terms of compensation. Sometimes it's partially cash, partially equity. Uh, sometimes it's all equity. Uh, we don't like to do that because we never know. Uh, but as I mentioned, sometimes investors uh, will say, well, we'll be the ones investing in the executive search. It doesn't have to come out of the, uh, uh, the coffers of the company. Uh, and that allows them to get a professional manager uh, who's got experience, you know, may, maybe many times over. Uh, but what we do is, uh, you know, we create a target list. We do a lot of market research. The research part of it is really important because that um, is determined by the position spec. Uh, you know, that portion of it can go uh, for into the, you know, the first month. And, uh, you know, we, we reach out to, in some cases, over 100 or 200 candidates when we're trying to find the right people, because when somebody's paying for an executive search, they don't want, uh, you know, the best person that com comes, becomes available, but the best person out there. And um, normally we don't have people that are looking for work. We go after them when they're, they're at the peak of their profession and just might be uh, lured into a startup situation based on uh, their current experience. So <laughs> once we're into week four to six, you know, you're looking at evaluation of candidates. Uh, you share it with the leadership team, sometimes the board and the leadership team. Uh, and uh, you start to uh, present candidates. And that process can go again for another month. Uh, and then you get down to, you know, from the 200, you know, raw numbers of suspects and candidates. Usually you get down to a top five or six people and uh, from that, you get a top three. And our goal as search consultants is to have three people that are A, qualified, B, they fit the budget, and C, are active and interested in this specific company and are ready to roll. And if we show, uh, you know, three people, it's, it's giving you, a, uh, as a, the hiring entity for hiring the search firm, a choice of three people that may fit 
a little bit different into your culture, and that's kind of usually the final decision. You want to add anything to that, Glenn? Well, I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking that if you follow the uh, recommendation that we're making at the onset of uh, adding uh, an H uh, retained search pro, if you will, to your advisory board, if you should need to go out and use executive search uh, down the road, the person that's been helping you grow the company, building your culture, doing all those things would, would hit the ground running to say the least. I mean, they would have intimate knowledge of your culture, how you, uh, the kind of people you like to hire, who might fit, who wouldn't fit, what you really need. And uh, again, uh, it would, you'd have a leg up, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Someone new, new firm, if you will, wouldn't have necessarily have to come in and, you know, learn the culture, learn the history of the company, learn the market you serve, learn who you're going after. They really have some in deep and uh, intimate knowledge of, of the organization. I think that would help recruit uh, the kind of talent that is needed and also that would fit in with uh, uh, the startup culture, so. So I guess we can go to the final slide. So we've already provided some case studies, uh, you know, and, and maybe since we're getting close to the top of the hour, uh, Len, would you uh, like us to engage some answers to questions or where do you want us to go at this point? I think we still have some time. Uh, did you go through all the case studies you wanted to go through? Um, if so, uh, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, um, you mentioned that an advisor can get equity or non-cash items. Can you discuss that a bit? You know, what, what specifically other than equity is non-cash or are there other ideas that people have used? Well, I think primarily some form of equity is, uh, uh, is the norm, if you will. I mean, I've got, uh, uh, for the container track, I got a boatload of options, uh, you know, that I paid cents on the dollar for. Uh, other companies, I did a lot of work for a company called Be Vocal. I got common stock. Um, it, it just varies, but I think that uh, not so much non-cash, but if I knew uh, the, fa the founder of the company uh, uh, had a place on Maui and I wanted to provide some of my services for the use of the condo or whatever. I mean, you could basically do barter. whatever you want, if you will. Yeah, barter works fine. <laughs> what, we, what we don't like to hear, and I'm sad to say we're approached with uh, uh, more than you might think is, well, gee, Lindsay, you know, if UNP can go out and find a CEO who can go out and, and raise the money we need to launch the company, uh, you know, we'll be able to pay that CEO. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, you know, that, that I, I think I'd walk away from. Uh, oh, and they want this, that CEO to be able to put some of his or her own cash into the company too. Uh, yeah, I think it's semi, pretty unrealistic, if you will. Um, yeah, Lindsay, no. I think, uh, just a real quick comment, I, I think the key that you're alluding to is, you know, think outside the box, you know, don't yes. limit yourself to kind of the traditional modes of compensation, be flexible, um, because the people that you're talking to that are going to be the right fit for an early stage company are going to be people who are open to being flexible and thinking about you know, some you know, unusual compensation structures. The, somebody who comes in just looking for cash and that's all they care about is probably not going to be the right fit at that point in the company's life cycle anyway. Yeah, I think that you mentioned earlier, Mark, a good point that talent is king. Talent is where it's out, but it, it maybe in front of the talent, you need to uh, put risky talent or talent willing to take risks. Yeah. 
Uh, because... I, I, can give, I can also give you another case study here, Len. Um, okay. you, we, Stanton Chase hosted an annual partners meeting, I don't know, what was it, Pete, a year and a half, two years ago? Yeah, October 2018. Okay. And we part of that, we had an innovation night where we brought in you know, um, early stage companies, innovators who just had some interesting technology. And um, I don't know, we must have had maybe 10 or 12 of them. And they just had display tables talking about what their invention was, their innovation, et cetera. And I maintained involvement with one of the companies that presented that night because it had been a successful product. It was pulled off the market uh, because they ran into some manufacturing issues and some uh, supply chain issues, and it really impacted not only the, the company's ability to sell, but the reputation as well. And um, through that involvement, he was working with a fractional CFO. So a CFO that wasn't a full-time employee, but somebody he contracted with to handle his financial and accounting. And at one point, he actually sent over the, a, an agreement that the fractional CFO wanted him to sign. Um, and in reviewing it, it was, I, you know, my comment back to him was, you know, run, don't walk from this agreement <laughs> because it was so one-sided to the fractional CFO's benefit. It locked the entrepreneur in for a couple of years of payment to the CFO, regardless of what happened with the company, how much money was raised, how much product was sold. And it really was an onerous obligation for the entrepreneur um, at a time when he couldn't afford to do that. And that there were other solutions that were certainly going to be much more palatable and much more affordable. Um, the other thing he was challenged with is he was um, talking to investors, but getting very frustrated because he was getting nowhere in those conversations. And he had a food and beverage product and he was talking to a lot of investors who just didn't understand that industry. And once we worked on the narrative, how he was telling the story, and finally, over time, got him to realize he's talking to the wrong people because he had a good value proposition. He just wasn't getting any traction. Uh, once he started talking to retired food executives, people who'd made investment in the food and beverage industry, understood the manufacturing challenges that he had had. And for them, it was really a moot point because they understood that happens to everybody in the industry versus the investors he was talking to previously who saw that as a red flag or a non-starter, it made a big difference in the reception he was getting, the traction he was getting with investors. So, you know, again, didn't result in anything from a search perspective for us, but the experience that we were able to bring, the perspective we were able to bring to help refocus him and keep him from making a critical mistake that would have given him a significant obligation financially, made a big difference in, uh, in where he was able to go with the company. Thanks, Mark. Um, we do have a question here uh, and it goes to, uh, what does somebody plan for as far as uh, the cost of retained search? Is that related to the salary that you're offering? Is it a flat fee? Uh, do you guys uh, have any, um, you know, as far as Stan's Chase is concerned, do you have any compensation uh, packages that would include maybe some warrants or how do, how do you guys work? I'll give you the, uh, this is another case study example, uh, but I'll you know, mix it in with this a statement of what our usual and customary fees are. So we, if we take a, you know, a $300,000 CFO, uh, our fee is going to be one third of cash compensation and it'll be paid, uh, that's our complete fee, and then the, that fee will be paid in three installments. One to start, uh, one after 30 days, one after 60 days. Now with startups, uh, oftentimes uh, the second two payments uh, could be orchestrated in a way that uh, you know, we actually perform to a specific uh, uh, standard for the, for the second and the third installment. And the one of the examples I wanted to share is there was a uh, frozen uh, treat product company that we worked with and uh, you know, they, they agreed and through the investors, it was kind of like a family uh, backed company and they um, had us looking for a CEO. Uh, and ultimately we started looking for about 30 days. We were paid the first installment 
and they found somebody to uh, take the CEO job for no cash pay and just uh, equity. And, you know, that worked out for both parties and that ultimately, uh, you know, we parted friends, but all we got was the first installment. So for one installment, they got a CEO, uh, although they found it on their own, they got a lot of really good, I think, background about what the market uh, looked like for CEOs uh, and, you know, what they'd have to pay. And ultimately they lucked out because they found somebody that uh, was willing to accept the role and just take equity as payment. And we do guarantee our searches. So uh, once somebody pays, uh, you know, that one third of first year's comp compensation, uh, we guarantee uh, up to two years uh, the stickiness of that individual. And that points a little bit to our vetting process, our screening, our background checking. By the time this individual takes the role at whatever company it may be, we're very, very secure in knowing that they'll stay there for a long time. Yeah provided the company survives. Yeah, thank you. I think that answers the question. Are there any other questions from anybody on the call? Now's the time to raise your hand or put it in chat. If not, I'll, I will um, take this opportunity to thank uh, Peter, Lindsay and Mark for your time today and putting this together. I know you worked over the weekend on this, so it's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, we have uh, recorded this and uh, we will have this in our archives uh, and have it available to our cohorts and the companies that come through the pre-accelerator in the future. Um, and we would hope that uh, the three of you are not strangers to the pre-accelerator. I know Mark <laughs> is uh, fairly close and, and, and easy to access, but uh, it looks like um, just reading what I just uh, came across my transom during this, it looks like LA County is uh, debating whether we should be in, it's uh, safer at home through the end of July. So this is gonna be a protracted uh, long-term thing, I think for all of us. And uh, uh, this is the new normal of how we can yeah. do business. So yeah. the good thing is I get to work with people like Lindsay up in Oregon and Peter up in Santa Barbara <laughs> and Mark down in Orange County. And we can, um, uh, we'll be able to uh, collaborate in the future. You know, a great entrepreneur will find his way around, under, or over any problem, <laughs> any day. I drive Pete out of his mind because I'm trained to uh, respond to no to it ain't possible. You know? right. <laughs> no is just a request for more information. Yeah, I mean, he knows. I you, That's when the fight begins, when you say no. And uh, I think uh, in order to be a successful entrepreneur, uh, being naive is absolutely critical. Uh, no, I mean, you'll laugh, but I mean, you got to be naive. If I had, uh, uh, every time someone questioned, what do you know about video and film and entertainment and uh uh i see uh peter sathy is on involved with creative and and i know of him and you know but you gotta believe so uh much and that you're on a mission from god to start that company and there's absolutely nothing there's no good time to start it today to me is this is good a time to start a business as ever i started my first company uh, when the prime was at 21 and a half and my money was at prime plus two and three quarters percent. It was the most the worst time to ever start a business, but didn't make any difference. It was that what we were on a mission from God to do. And for everybody that said, oh, you guys are going to go bankrupt. You're going out of business before you'll ever get started. And uh, that gave us, that increased our resolve. I said, I want to put these guys out of business. And we did because we got the best people and we borrowed their, stole their people from our competitors and we treated them better. And we, you know, so uh, that I honestly believe naivete is really important because you know, the first time you hit a Friday and you're hitting the wall and you don't have any money to pay any of your employees, uh, 
that's not uncommon. And, uh, you know, it'll keep, it'll drive you nuts, but it comes with the territory. Every day's a challenge. Every day changes. You're constantly, when you start to achieve some success, trying to hold the, the boat steady when everybody pulling you in 12 different directions becomes, uh, it's like drugs. I mean, you want to do go off and do every joint venture, everything that comes your way, but you know that if you do, uh, the company will employ, implode under its own weight. So I really have a lot of respect for everybody in the audience, whoever you may be. Uh, follow your dream, follow your passion. Now's as good a time as any to start a company. Don't give up. Surround yourself with good people like uh, like Lynn and, and the program and suck it for all the uh, valuable information you can get and one day at a time and you will be successful. So. Well, with that, Lindsay, that's a great uh, ending off point. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, again, thanks, Lynn. Lindsay, Mark, thank you very much. Thank Mark. you. Our pleasure, thanks, Lynn. Okay. Next week, uh, we have a program on how to price your product or service uh, with Pear Seffers. So uh, join us then, uh, same time, uh, next Tuesday at noon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Everybody.